From advertising to software as a service to data. Across all of our programs and clients, we've seen a 55 to 65 percent open rate. Getting brands authentically integrated into content performs better than TV advertising. Typical lifespan of an article is about 24 to 36 hours. If we're reaching out to the right person with the right message and a clear call to action, then it's just a matter of timing. Welcome to the MarTech Podcast, and I hear everything production. In this podcast, you'll hear the stories of world-class marketers that use technology to drive business results and achieve career success. We'll unearth the real-world experiences of some of the brightest minds in the marketing and technology space so you can learn the tools, tips, and tricks they've learned along the way. Now here's the host of the MarTech Podcast, Benjamin Shapiro. Welcome to the MarTech Podcast. I'm your host, Benjamin Shapiro, and today we're going to discuss the dynamic evolution of connected television advertising and its impact on the media landscape. Joining us is Angela Voss, who is the CEO of Marketing Architects, which is an all-inclusive TV agency that rebuilt the traditional agency model to help brands drive profitable growth. Marketing Architects has spent 25 years building homegrown technology to solve its TV pricing, measurement, and scale challenges. And in addition to providing us with our guest today, Marketing Architects is also a sponsor of the MarTech Podcast. So far this week, Angela and I have talked about navigating the evolution of connected TV advertising and crafting effective TV campaign strategies. And today we're going to wrap up our conversation talking about how to plan tech-driven TV campaigns. All right, here's the last part of my conversation with Angela Voss, the CEO of Marketing Architects. Angela, welcome back to the MarTech Podcast. Happy to be here again. It's been fun. It's always a pleasure to have you here. Always excited to talk to one of our sponsors. And I'm excited to wrap up our conversation today where we've covered a lot of ground. Everything from why TV, how to think about targeting, strategy, figure out how to put your media by together. We did a couple of case studies yesterday. And I was kind of springing this on you of I made up this brand that sells travel guitars and has some influencers and and made you think of a strategy off the top of your head. It was a lot of fun for me, probably not so much for you. (laughs) But the reality is when I think about something like TV advertising, a lot of it ends up being event based. I want to run a television campaign targeting suburban dads in their 40s. Well, sure, you can always buy media on country music television station, but you might want to time your TV buy to be specifically around the Grammys or the country music awards or what have you. So when you're going through your calendar, once you've rationalized that television actually works, how do you make sure that you understand sort of the seasonality and ebbs and flows, knowing that your television campaigns, your stations, your shows are not always going to be a static thing? I think a lot of marketers come into television favoring in their minds the content that we love to watch. And that could be because they think that's just what everyone watches and that's how we should get in front of them. It could also be because I really want to see my brand in the Super Bowl. We get that too. There's a lot of use cases for television. And in some cases, those make sense, but they generally are very high priced. Optimizing for ego. (laughs) Right. We could say optimizing for ego. We could also say we're about to do a round of funding and we really want a lot of eyeballs on the brand. Cool. TV is great for that. But when we think about television, ultimately, we're using a very high reach medium. And there are events like an award show, like a Super Bowl event, etc., that pull in a lot of reach at one time. But TV is getting reach every single day, every single hour. And so if we're really strategic about how we intersect reaching a consumer with the cost of reaching that consumer, we can in some cases 5x the amount of reach just because we're really thoughtful about how we do that. We're not forcing all of that reach or as much reach needs to happen in one single moment, in which case we're likely going to pay potentially even 20 times what we might otherwise. But instead, we're looking at it going, I need reach against this target. 
I don't want it to all fall in overnights, of course, and things like that. But there are ways to be in premium inventory with patients that will maximize your dollar so much further than just choosing and cherry picking these high profile events. It's not always the high profile events. You mentioned the Super Bowl, and I made the joke of optimizing for ego. But at times with certain industries, there are specific events that tend to be interesting. Let's say you're targeting sports fans. Sure, there is always a sports center on ESPN that's a daily show, but there are playoff seasons in each major league that might be important. They don't happen. That's basically one a quarter, NFL, NBA, NHL, whatever it is. And you probably want to heavy up your media buying if you're targeting that audience when there are the most eyeballs. I'm assuming that your Tuesday afternoon NBA game in the beginning of the season is not going to be as impactful as a playoff game between the Warriors and the Lakers. Go Dubs. How do you think about shifting the scale a little bit to not just be buying the individual product, not just the show, the NBA, but specific games where there's going to be prominence. Does that actually matter or is every NBA game the same? It all depends on the cost. If you're a performance marketer and I can be in that Tuesday game for a tenth the cost of the Saturday game, but there's maybe half of the audience, that's a really great buy for me. Because ultimately, if I'm looking for visits, orders, conversions, my rate of conversion is going to be much more effective with that positive intersect of the cost versus the impression. And I mean, I think too, there are sporting events, but when we think about seasonality, I mean, you think about products that make their entire year in like two weeks during the holiday. Right. There are going to be situations in which, in this case, lately, our holiday seasons are being spread out. They're now spreading into September, but there are key weeks that really, really, really matter to certain brands. And of course, you're going to have to heavy up during those. That's when buying behavior is really prevalent. You're going to potentially have higher prices during that time. But that's all a part of your overarching strategy. And as long as you've planned for those costs and have a good idea of what response is going to look like, we should be able to make that work in our overall annual plan. A total aside, I went to Target yesterday because we live on the block that gets more people trick-or-treating than any place I've ever seen, ever. So I went to buy an extra thousand pieces of candy to make sure that we had enough ammo to get through the evening. And the Christmas decorations were in front of the Halloween decorations on the day of Halloween. And people were out there buying it. I was like, who are you, psychos? It's (laughs) October. Yes, I know. They're out. Anyway, sorry. You're lucky there was any Halloween candy left on Halloween. We already had 2,000 pieces. I went to buy an extra thousand just to get through the night. It was gone by seven o'clock. I want to change the subject again. You ever see the show The Marvelous Miss Maisel? I have heard of it. My daughter has talked about it, but I haven't watched it myself. The first season was hilarious. You got to go back and watch it. And I was going to ask you, tell me how far into the fifth season you got. Because nobody I know has actually watched through the fifth season. Maybe people, I'm sure people have. But everybody I know got to season three or season four and was like, you lost me. Okay. It just got, it wasn't good. It got complicated or what? The same joke over and over again, in my opinion. Okay. Some shows start out and go gangbusters and then fade off, right? When you're buying your media, Mm -hmm. the actual content is not the same every time. So how do you figure out when to anchor on a show, assuming that it's going to be the same or dump it because the visitors and the viewership just isn't there anymore? There's a lot of data that flows through, in our case, Annika, that helps us make those decisions. A lot of forecasted data by Nielsen, a lot of real-time data based on clients that we're running. It's a mix. It's very infrequently that we will anchor a brand to a show. Because again, if we're anchoring to a show, then that probably means that we need some frequency within that show in order to make an impact. And if we're trying to get three spots within one hour versus, again, thinking impression first, how do I get that consumer? Because that consumer is not only watching that show. So we really want to center our ad placements around the most effective delivery versus clustering them up in one single hour, something like that. All right. So it's a programmatic approach. The strategy here is to not be so focused on one individual piece of content, one individual show, one individual season, one individual event. 
you're buying an audience. You're buying across multiple different shows. And that's the beauty of some sort of a programmatic buying exercise is that you're able to distribute your media broadly. So how do you figure out what the balance is from casting a wide net, targeting an audience, to making sure that every piece of media you're buying is worthwhile? It's all back to that response data. I mean, if we think about a lot of the topic that we've been discussing over these last couple of days has been tech's role in TV advertising, be it CTV or whatever. Attribution is a huge topic for television. There's been a lot of development in the space. It used to just be methods like maybe you set up A-B regional tests and you're looking for incremental lift in a set of markets versus another set of markets, which is a fair strategy and is still used today. But there's a lot of new strategies that really help smart buyers make really effective decisions about should I be buying this show or that show and how many times in this show or that show is effective. We look at attribution on a variety of levels. There's time-based analysis. ACR is a fairly new technology, which is automatic content recognition. It helps to identify what content is playing on a traditional TV by sort of listening to the audio or looking at the audio. And ACR can recognize and record that information. And then that data helps advertisers know how many people saw their ads and can be used to measure the effectiveness because that's all being routed through their IP address. So they can sort of tie a loop between this consumer saw this ad and then visited nuts.com as an example. Same thing with IP-based attribution that's used in CTV. So we've got a lot of data as marketers now that help us make really smart decisions. We don't have to go based on, well, I feel based on age-old planning practices that the frequency of three as one, I'm sure is something that we've all heard. We need to be in front of a consumer three times in order to drive a sale. Those are legacy thoughts, generally speaking. When you're actually looking at driving a sale and incenting that sales activation side of things, the first impression is going to be the most effective. Now, if we are only trying to, which we don't have any clients doing this, but if we were only trying to build brand awareness, then yeah, we got to be in front of that consumer several times in order to make that impression. And those impressions need to sit well, right? They need to be memorable. They need to be engaging, story-based, things that we want to remember, not just logic features and benefits type messaging. So it really is tied back to what's the objective that we're going out trying to do in television. And then what's the technology that we're leaning into in order to ensure that whatever we are doing, we have a solid understanding of whether it's working, whether it's not and how to optimize it for growth. Angel, the last question I have for you, we talked so much about the media buying and the placement and I kind of brushed over the creative part. When you go back to, all right, well, we've been running television advertising, we're trying to find the right placements. How do you isolate for the fact that it's not just the placement, but also the media? How do you isolate whether it's a message problem or a media problem if your campaigns aren't working? It's a question that maybe scares marketers away from TV at times, because as they think about, yeah, I'd love to get my brand into television. I'm trying to make that decision whether or not 2024 is the year I'm going to do that. I'm going to invest potentially hundreds of thousands into producing that creative message. I'm going to put it into the market. What if I get it wrong? Depending on how much you spent, if you've used AI or if you haven't used AI, it could be upwards of a couple hundred thousand dollars to produce that commercial. It's a great question for us because as a business, we invest for our clients in the commercial production. And that started years ago for us when we were only operating in radio. We found that after a couple of rounds of creative testing, if we didn't hit the nail on the head, the clients started to kind of, I don't really know if I want to continue to test because it was expensive to them at that time. And this was just talking about radio. And so ultimately, we ended up deciding, okay, you know what, we're going to put our own capital into creative production for our clients in radio. And then when we launched television in 2009, we did the same thing. So it was a big question for us because it was our dollar. So ultimately, what we ended up doing was building out a pre-testing platform 
proprietary to us to help us understand how the commercial will perform before it's produced. We had this 20-year bed of history in both radio and a little bit of television as well to help us understand what will ring the bell and what won't. And this helps prove your commercial's impact with these proprietary predicted tools. And there are others out there as well, but helps to determine how your commercial will perform in market and then optimize to drive maximum revenue and brand growth before even launching your campaign. Things like eye tracking software. Like if we're just sitting in a room and coming up with a creative idea, ultimately building a script for that, going into production and kind of crossing our fingers and hoping that that works, testing in market only versus pre-testing, then there's opportunity there. We should absolutely go into television with insights already that we're putting the best creative in market. You know, it's proof for the reason why you need to work with somebody who's an expert with something as complicated as media buying for television. You have to nail a whole bunch of different stuff to get it right. You have to be able to create the right content. You have to understand whether that content is going to resonate with your audience. Then you have to be able to put it in the right place at the right time consistently and broadly enough so you're reaching a high enough volume of people to drive volume. But if you get it right, it can be one of the biggest, most impactful channels for you. And that's what marketing architects does for their clients. And that wraps up this episode of the MarTech Podcast. Thanks for listening to my conversation with Angela Voss, the CEO of Marketing Architects. If you'd like to hear more from Angela, you can find a link to her LinkedIn profile in our show notes. You can contact her on Twitter. Her handle is MarkArch, that's M-A-R-K-A-R-C-H. Or you can visit her company's website, which is marketingarchitects.com. You can also listen to their podcast, which is The Marketing Architects, or find their book, The All-Inclusive TV Book. Just one more link in our show notes I'd like to tell you about. If you didn't have a chance to take notes while you were listening to this podcast, head over to martechpod.com where we have summaries of all of our episodes and contact information for our guests. You can also subscribe to our weekly newsletter and you can even apply to be the next guest speaker on the MarTech Podcast. Of course, you can always reach out on social media. Our handle is martechpod, M-A-R-T-E-C-H-P-O-D on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Or you can contact me directly on LinkedIn. My handle is Ben J. Shap, B-E-N-J-S-H-A-P. And if you haven't subscribed yet and you want a daily stream of marketing and technology knowledge in your podcast feed, we're going to publish an episode every day this year. So hit the subscribe button in your podcast app and we'll be back in your feed tomorrow morning. All right, that's it for today. But until next time, my advice is to just focus on keeping your customers happy. 